Awesome. And we all got the little robot telling us that that we're being recorded. So we've got that going. Wonderful. Uh, we can go ahead and start as some um, more people kind of trickle in through the waiting room. So um, as I said, when we first hopped on, welcome back, everyone, and welcome to new faces who may have not been to this interest group before. This is the Science Communication and Education Interest Group um, for the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics. And we have been running this since about 2020. We took a little bit of a hiatus at the end of last year into this year as um, I have been moderating and kind of running discussion with this group and I got a new job. So I'm currently working um, actually as a science communicator for a laboratory that's run out of Arizona State University, but um, primarily I'm working as a science communicator for a project in the lab called the Hawaii Monitoring and Reporting Collaborative. So I'm based out of Hawaii now, which is why we changed the um, Zoom time so I did not have to lead a meeting at 6 a.m. So thank you all for being being willing to do that. Um, and I have absolutely been loving working working in science communication for this organization. I'm definitely planning on one of our meetings later in the year, telling all of you a little bit about my experience with this job so far and how some of the science communication tactics that we've all been talking about for the last couple of years with the consortium um, have really helped me and um, been able to see some really cool work happen, happen in this job. And um, kind of what day-to-day -day looks like and how science communication is being utilized by, by my boss and by her lab to be able to better her community relations with the project and also some of our research. So we'll definitely do that later this year, but all of that to say, um, wonderful to see you all again. Um, I'm finally settled into my new, new home and new job, and um, I'm absolutely stoked to see you all again and get to start these back up. So just a few housekeeping things. I wanted to start also with an um, introduction for those of you who, who don't know. Um, I wanted to go around and introduce everyone, but also specifically um, Mariana, who has been leading the smaller um, science communication group for the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics. So she has just been absolutely awesome in like helping restart these meetings and get everything put together. So we'll do an introduction for those of you who don't know, know her and then also all of us. Um, and that being said, this will be a recurring meeting and we're gonna do it monthly on the third Tuesday of every single month. So like this Tuesday at 9 a.m. my time, noon Pacific Standard Time, and then whatever other time you happen to call from. Um, I know Ariadne, are you still on the East Coast? Yes. Awesome. So we have, we have people from all over joining in the call, which um, is definitely one of my favorite parts about, about Zoom. I have a lot of things I don't like about Zoom, but getting to chat with people all over the world at the same time is definitely my favorite. Um, so I will start off with some introductions. And then just to make it easy, I'll go ahead and call out names as they are on my screen. Um, I don't want to take up too much time because we have a great presentation and discussion today. So just go ahead and say your name, the organization that you are um, associated with the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics with. And then um, let's do, if you could be any ocean animal, what would you be? I know we've done that one before, but I want to hear everybody's responses and um, from people who are new in the group. So my name is Ellie. I am the executive director of Everblue, which is a nonprofit that does science communication work. And we have been partnering with the consortium to um, help lead this interest group over the last couple of years. And if I could be an ocean animal, I would want to be a gray whale because I think that their habitat migration patterns from Alaska down to California, like Baja California is super lovely. And I would love to just hang out in the kelp forests. Um, Stacy, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Stacy Harper. I'm a professor at Oregon State University. Um, uh, principal investigator on the NSF grant that established our Pacific Northwest Consortium, and I co-lead that now with Suzanne. Um, and if I was to be an animal, I am choosing a manatee because I heard that they continually fart to maintain their buoyancy in the water. So I thought that was real fun. And, and they don't care that they look silly. They just really don't. <laughs> I'm definitely going to try that next time I'm scuba diving. Um, Suzanne, will you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself next? Hi, everyone. Suzanne Brander. I am an associate professor at Oregon State, and I am co-lead of the Pacific Northwest Consortium and consider myself to be an ecotoxicologist. 
Oh, and sea animal. I'm still going to stick with sea turtle. That seems seems like a safe one. Happy and calm. Um, Mariana, would you introduce yourself next? Hello, I am Mariana Inahosa. I am a marine biology major, chemistry minor at Oregon State University, and I work with the Marine Studies Initiative part-time and the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics the other part of the time. Um, so that's my involvement, and I do the science communication with them. Um, I would probably be a nudibranch because they're so fabulous and fun and beautiful, and I just like to think that they like the Elton John of the sea. So there we go. <laughs> I love those. Those are my favorite to see when I'm diving. Um, and Brittany, will you go next? Hi, my name is Brittany and I am a PhD student at Oregon State University in the Harper Lab. Um, and I think we're doing what animal we would be. And I always say uh, sea otter. I think they're super cute. We can hang out in the kelp forest together. Ezra? Hi, I'm Ezra. I use the gender neutral pronouns Z, Z, or Z, or they, them, theirs. Um, and I am a scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And I would probably be a seahorse because they're like super in love with their partner and do like a little dance with their partner seahorse every day. And that's very much my partner and I's vibe. I think that's the most lovely thing that I've heard all morning. Ariadne, will you go next? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, my name is Ariadne Demula. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, the company that I work uh, with through this great um, consortium is Paramount Planet Product. And we want to make ocean compostable fish friendly packaging and testing standard for any packaging. Uh, and my favorite animal is. Uh, I actually also a sea otter, but that was already taken. So my second favorite one, and I, I love it. They're cute. They like hold hands, but I will go with killer whale orcas because they are so cool how they all work together and communicate. So. Love it. Okay. And Lily. Hi, my name is Lily Estellum. Um, I'm a second year undergrad at OSU. Um, I'm part of, I, um, Dr. Brander's kind of smaller science communication group. Um, and if I were to be a sea animal, I would probably go with a sea lion because they kind of just lay on the beach and do nothing. <laughs> That's awesome. I always think they look so like graceful underwater and then they get on land and they're just like, eh. <laughs> um, Bella, will you go next? Hi, I'm Bella. I'm a master's student in Stacy's lab at Oregon State. And if I were to be an ocean animal, I think I'd want to be an anglerfish because I think they're cool with their little life. Solid. Getting into the deep sea. Taylor, will you go next? Hi, um, I'm Taylor. I'm one of the summer interns for Ocean Plastic Recovery. Um, I'm getting a bachelor's in uh, polymer materials engineering um, at Western Washington University. So love plastic stuff. Um, and I think I would also say I would want to be a sea slug or a nudibranch. I love how fun and weird and colorful they are. I love it. We've got a little sea slug family going on. Uh, Jamie, will you go next? Uh, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm also an undergraduate student at Western studying polymer materials. Uh, also one of the OPR summer interns. And I had to Google ocean animals because for some reason, as soon as you said it, I was like, I don't know anything besides fish. So I would go with the clownfish. That's like awesome. Hey, pet. there's a lot of fish to choose from. So you're good. You're good with fish. Uh, Jared? Hey everyone, my name is Jared. I'm a PhD candidate in the Harper Talks Lab here at Oregon State. Um, like Ellie, I liked the range of the orca because they can kind of go everywhere. And also the social aspect, like Ariadne was saying. And also, I don't want to be at the bottom of the food chain because that doesn't sound like a good time. So I don't want to, I want to be able to sleep at night knowing I'm not going to wake up a snack. 
I love it. You had to have like the multiple like explanation of the orca. All right. And David, I saved you for last. So you can go ahead and introduce yourself. And then if you want to, you could just hop into your presentation from there. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. What a fun group. This is fantastic. Um, love seeing everyone's smiling faces. Um, I'm David Rizul. Uh, I am with ASU. I'm a media relations officer here in ASU Central Communications Hub, the Media Relations Strategic Communications Office. Um, and but sea animal I would be. I actually recently read an article um, about sea dragons. And I don't know if anyone here specializes in sea dragons, but they just look like the coolest things. The, the leafy sea dragon and the um, weedy sea dragon. Oh my goodness, it's beautiful. Um, just the, all the colorful photos and it was funny because uh, the article was in New York Times and they, the photos were from the Birch Aquarium in San Diego. Um, and actually know the science communicator at the aquarium. So I sent her a note. I was like, your sea dragons are beautiful. I need to come by and see them sometime. Um, and that's my extent of my knowledge of the sea. <laughs> okay, um, may I share my screen um, or my PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and make you a co-host. Um, nope, I just have to go ahead and make you a full host. It's not letting me do a co-host. So you are now going to become the host use your powers wisely. <laughs> okay. Okay, do you guys see this PowerPoint? Yep, we can see it. Okay, uh, let's go back a little bit. Yes, you see the white screen? Yep, white screen is there. Perfect. Uh, okay. Um, Let's just get this started. So like I said, I'm a media relations officer here um, at ASU. And really what that means is my job is to promote research, which I think is the coolest thing. Um, my job is to work with the professors. Um, and as I heard, many of you guys are in academia to distill research and write news stories about them and promote them to the local media, local and national media. Um, and you may ask how I got here. So. Here's my presentation. Okay, so um, I had a little bit of a windy path to where I'm at today. Um, so I'll talk about early on and my time in the biotech realm and rock climbing. You might ask, why is he talking about rock climbing? Um, and ASU and today. Okay, so I'm curious, and I, I know I can't see all of you at the same time, but does anyone here not have a science background um, by raise of hands or virtual hands? No, everyone has a science background. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, I don't. Um, and uh, my background is in journalism. Um, so journalism and public relations. So I, I studied uh, journalism PR in college at San Diego State University um, and kind of fell in love with the idea that it could be my job to raise the visibility of organization or causes that I care about. Um, I thought that would be an incredible experience. Um, and also in high school, I wasn't the most, uh, I wasn't the best at math or science, so I thought it would be a perfect fit um, for, it for me. So towards the end of college, um, I knew I wanted to do public relations, but I didn't necessarily know what field I wanted to go into. Um, but I knew what fields I did not want to go into. So while my peers in the communications journalism track um, someone to go into sports PR or entertainment PR or hospitality. Um, for me, I, I wanted to be in a field that I felt was a little more impactful and meaningful to me personally. Um, so just through fortunate events and networking, um, I ran into a, a gal who worked at a public relations firm that specialized in life science. So this firm specialized in working with biotech and pharmaceutical companies, which at that time as fresh out of college just was so intimidating. Um, just all the, the jargon that comes with 
you know, any heavy technical science um, on top of the responsibility to be the person to promote that to the general audience um, was really daunting. Um, but I decided to, to take the leap um, because at the end of the day, what was driving me was knowing that the companies that I was gonna be working with were working on these experimental drugs that ultimately are helping to try to save lives and cure diseases. Um, and I cannot be more grateful for taking that jump. So uh, in my office uh, in, 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 at this biotech pharmaceutical firm, um, it was, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by um, half scientists and half communicators. So it was a great melt um, where together we, we worked to tell the best stories in the clearest way to our targeted audiences. You know, um, and it sounds like many of you guys here are already in the science communications field, but um, as you know, it's it's just a team effort. You know, how do we, how can we clearly tell these stories to reach whatever visibility goals we may have to attract as many new consumers to, to get more funding for whatever the project may be. So the firm I worked at, um, we specialized in, uh, me in media relations and reputation management. Um, so as many of you guys know, we work on traditional media relations. So uh, writing press releases and pitching them out to media for media coverage. Uh, but also um, at this firm, I really learned more about holistically, um, how can we raise the visibility of an organization um, and the reputation of an organization without traditional means? So beyond a blog, you know, beyond social media, beyond media relations, um, what can we do? Uh, something that I really took away that I didn't know about through my education in college was really community relations and working with conference organizers to have the people who represent the companies that I worked for on stage. Because at there, they're, they're at a leadership position and they're talking to their direct peers. You know, with all the noise in the world and the news cycle, you know, how, how do we cut through that and be heard? You know, so, so it, was, it, was a great, it, it was a great experience, not only doing conference you know relations but also pitching our executives for different awards and 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 different um magazine recognitions um which all was so fruitful and um, so the top uh, top photo uh, to the left is a company that i worked with that harnessed the microbiome uh for ulcerative, ulcerative colitis diseases um, and they had a collaboration with Stanford. So that's a, a piece in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, the bottom, I worked with Johnson & Johnson. They have a research and development group called uh, Johnson, Johnson Innovation that works to innovate clinical trials. Um, and the top right is me speaking at a conference. Uh, and the bottom right is just a fun one of me and my colleagues. Okay, so... Um, so I worked in the life science field for a half a decade, uh, five, almost six years. Um, but it came to a point um, where I recognized that I necessarily wasn't passionate about the biotech pharma space. There are certain things um, that didn't align with my values. Um, and I had to work especially hard to do the extra work to understand this complex material. Um, so I'm an avid rock climber. Um, I, I love the environment and being outside um, and I'm so inspired by our natural world um, that I told myself that if there's a way um, to be able to couple my professional experience with what I care about outside, um, that would be the dream. Um, I would love that. Um, so this is a photo of the Utah desert, um, really right below Moab, if anyone's been over there. Um, and this photo is actually just last week. Uh, I was over there in uh, Wyoming, uh, climbing for, for 
uh, 10 days. Um, so I, I took this leap. Um, I bought a lot of people coffee to learn about what they do in environmental communications. I had a lot of informational interviews. I literally made a spreadsheet uh, about organizations that I thought would be of interest. Um, and one by one sent emails and uh, calls and um, eventually um, made my way over to ASU, um, which I'm so grateful for. So in 2019, um, I started working with ASU's School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. Um, so the school specialized in all things geography, climatology, um, and urban planning. And it, by far, is the best decision I could have made. Um, I am constantly inspired by academia, um, by students, by faculty, by research. I know many of you guys are in academia or in school right now. Um, and me, uh, coming from working at a public relations agency, um, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea about the realm uh, of academia or research. Um, and so once I was able to dip my toe into it um, and learned really about um, everything from mapping deforestation to um, coral reefs, you know, to using heavy chunks of data to attract diseases, um, I, I, was, I was hooked. Um, not only that, but to be able to meet the people behind the research. You know, I mean, as you guys know the most intimately, you know, a certain kind of person wants to dedicate five, 10 years of their life towards, a, towards research or a dissertation on a certain subject. You know, and for me in this role at a, my original role at ASU in the School of Geographical Science and Urban Planning, it was to tell these stories. You know, this role, um, unlike my agency role, um, was more of a broad marketing communications role. So at ASU, um, I not only wrote stories and pitched them to the media, but also helped support events, uh, colloquiums, um, helped uh, run social media. Let's see if I can move my slide. Um, so here is uh, on the top corner is a poster event I helped promote. Um, right below that is a colloquium um, with one of our assistant professors. Um, and then the two stories to the left um, or to the right are different stories on student research and uh, faculty research. So a new chapter with a new reach. Okay, how am I doing on time? I'm good. Um, so perfect. Um, so as of March of this year, I transitioned to my current role um, here at ASU Central Hub. Um, this is my office right here around the corner. Um, whereas um, I no longer am focused specifically on one school, um, but as a media relations officer in the science department, um, my job is to, to distill professor research, like I said, specifically for the schools of sustainability, the School of Geographical Science and Urban Planning, Global Futures Lab, and the Department of Psychology. So I personally believe that this role is my favorite parts of my last job distilled into one, you know, because now I, you know, can focus on, on purely writing and, and storytelling, you know, and, and really creating this awareness about this research that I, I care about. And not only that, but it really has broadened my horizon around what other research is going on around ASU. So for example, specifically in the last school, I focused a lot around climatology, like, um, like heat um, and extreme weather events. Uh, but now in this role, I'm learning a lot more about ecology and water. You know, the, the situation about this about the Colorado drought is huge. And I'm working really closely with the ASU researchers here at the Kyle Water Center um, about what does that mean for Arizona? What does that mean for the future cities? Um, I'm working with sustainability professors uh, around food sustainability. How, how are these systems created and how can we transform these food systems to make a more sustainable future? Uh, here are some examples of some things I've been working on. 
um, the top left corner um, is a story I wrote uh, around um, a visiting professor from Yale who is on the International Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, and was one of the authors of the recent report um, talking to ASU uh, about city's role um, in solution in solutions. Um, and the bottom corner is uh, the water uh, researcher Sarah Porter um, on Arizona Horizon PBS um, talking about the water situation in the Colorado River. And in the right side um, is a researcher, Ariane Medell, who focuses on something called mean radiant temperature. So how we, how we're, how felt heat, how, how we feel heat uh, is different than regular air temperature or surface temperature to created this uh, mobile weather machine and tested around different new materials like cool pavement uh, and also looks at which shade may be cooling with the intention of lowering the urban heat island. So I'll close out um, and just saying that, you know, like many of you, I think science communications is just the best job ever. Yeah, I think that I am paid to learn. You know, I'm constantly learning um, and learning new things uh, that I find meaningful. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of close out just saying is that, you know, for me, people in academia and people who do research work so hard, you know, and I just want to do them justice, right? I feel like so much work is put in to the scientific papers and to really helping better the world that we live in, you know, and if I can play any part in making that information more accessible, you know, and creating more awareness, then together we can create change. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your journey with us. And I always love hearing how people get to the place that they're at, you know, all the different decisions and, um, you know, life moments where you finally figure out like, oh, this is, this is where I'm going. I love your story about just like, I bought so many people coffee, you know, cause that's the best way to learn is just like, Hey, I want to have a chat with you. Um, so now we've got, oh, perfect. We've got a good half hour left for discussion. Um, and so I know I have a bunch of questions, but I wanted to open it up to everyone um, to ask David any questions about his, his work in science communication, his education in media relations and journalism, or um, anything you want to bring up. You know, if you also have questions for other people in the group about the research that they're doing, like this is just an open discussion period. And David, feel free to ask questions as well. So um, I, will, I will be silent for a little bit, let everyone um, ask some questions. And if not, I'm certainly going to jump in with a few of my own. Yeah, Jared. Oh, sweet. All right. Um, hey, I really, I could really connect with what you said about buying people coffees. <laughs> I did that a lot at my last job, just trying to transition my role from being focused on transportation engineering to more environmental planning. So I had to make, uh, do some networking within my company. But I was wondering, because you, at the beginning, you had asked how many of us have backgrounds in science. And I was curious about the variety slash um, kind of qualifications required to work in science communication to the degree that you're working in science communication. Um, are there a lot of people that have like technical backgrounds that then transition into these communication roles? Or is it mostly people with journalism degrees? I'm kind of curious about that. Or do you need some sort of minor? Because yeah. obviously there's like a lot of communication involved in, in the science that we do. It's just communicated in a different way, right? Absolutely. No, great question. You know, and what I'm finding more and more is that it's almost a split half, you know, and I, I think uh, very much so, I'm grateful for being exposed to it early on in my career at that agency where it was half scientists, half communicators. Um, and only as I've progressed um, in the science communication field, I'm finding that more and more relevant, um, which is really interesting. And it's in, in something I will note um, 
here here in this talk is that just in conversations with other science communicators, you know, there's this really prevalent, um, you know, imposter syndrome associated with, with science communications that I personally feel too sometimes is because the communicators don't think that I can talk about the science and the scientists can't talk about, I can't write, you know, um, but we're all doing it, right? We're all doing it, we're all making it work and someone has to do it. And, and I think, you know, honestly, as, as long as, as we're trying, I mean, that's the best thing. Um, so, you know, I, I'm finding uh, more and more that a lot of my colleagues do not have um, both a journalism and science degree. Um, I, I am familiar with some colleagues who do have science certificate, science communication certificates. I know, um, or, or degrees. I know UC, um, UC Santa Cruz has a science communications program that I know a, a number of my communication colleagues have gone through. Um, I also know UCSD has a certificate science communications program. Um, all can be very helpful, um, but um, I don't, you know, I, I believe it's not required necessarily to have additional um, education um, unless you want, it. you know, um, I, I think, you know, if I were to have continued in the biotech pharmaceutical field, I think I would have gone back to school because that the information that I was talking about was very, very technical and it would have only helped to benefit me. Um, but I think in the realm of the environmental uh, climate communications, um, I, I think I, I've been able to work with these professors and, and tell the story quite clearly, clearly. And I guess I have like one follow up. Thanks for that response, by the way. Um, and I, I do have a follow up kind of question related to um, the types of communications that you do. Is it mostly like uh, media broadcast or do you have, are there a lot of, do you know of a lot of efforts where they're like, focusing on educational communication I guess it mo I mean science communication is like mm -hmm. educational like at a fundamental level but are there any like little like programs specific to like oh like this is a series of communications that we're trying to put together to educate somebody on a topic hmm. yeah so so it's kind of great the way my office is structured and hopefully this answers your question so uh, in my office, there in the ASU Central Communications office, there's four science communicators. So we all have our specific areas of interest. So I, I'm in climate environmental science, where my colleague specializes in engineering. My other colleague specializes in space. My other college colleague specializes in health sciences. So it's great because that way we each have our own buckets and we can work with work with reporters who specialize in those spaces and develop those relationships. So if um, a, a, a third of my job is reactive uh, media relations, so if a reporter calls into ASU's office asking to talk to an expert on this heat wave that we're having, um, they contact me and I direct them to the correct um, expert in the field. Um, and that also goes with when academic papers are being published, you know, um, so I have my own buckets of sustainability, school geographical sciences, urban planning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I am the one who's in control of distributing that information to the correct sources. That's really cool. Yeah, that sounds very fun and interesting. So thanks for that. Thanks. And I honestly, I think I have the best subject. I couldn't do it for, for <laughs> space or engineering. <laughs> yeah. Or chemistry. <laughs> yeah. I think um, piggybacking off of that, you know, one of the things that I, I loved when I met David was like we had we had lunch and got to just chat about like how he has a background in in journalism and and communications and like media relations. And I do science communication, but I don't have a background in journalism, you know, and I love I love writing and I love communicating. And obviously you guys have watched me MC this for months. Like I love I love communicating and leading discussions, but I don't have a background in journalism. My background is in science. And so it was cool to get to meet him and kind of like realize where our minds like mesh and how we can learn different things from each other. So um, one of my questions I had for you, David, was like, what what's one of the things that you learned 
in your formal education for or informal, um, but specifically from learning about like journalism and media relations about how to best communicate science or maybe like a best practices thing that you think that we might not learn with a science background? Like what's something that's kind of like a skill that's specific to journalism or media relations? I mean, top of mind, I think, you know, in college, I did a lot of writing. <laughs> I did a lot, a lot of writing and not much. I, I, took, I think I took two science classes. I think I took a geology class because I was so interested in like an extreme weathers course. Uh, and it's actually a funny anecdote is uh, in my job interview in my first job out of college with the biotech pharma firm, um, they asked when's the last time I took a biology class. I was like, oh, sophomore year in high school <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but with all that said, um, I, 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 the, one of the biggest takeaways I, I had from uh, my formal education in journalism um, that may, you may probably already know is, is really the focus on what audiences we're talking to. You know, how can we use similar language to the audiences that we want to reach? Um, for example, when I first, in my first job in, in, at the PR uh, biotech pharma firm, um, a lot of the communication I was doing was B2B, was business to business. My target audience wasn't the general public. Uh, my target audience was more science heavy trade publications because the goals of these biotech pharma firms was to get more funding or get acquired, you know, or, or, or really to, to really get, to get more venture capital. Um, so the language that we were using in those kind of communications was completely different than if we were trying to target a general public for um, clinical trial recruitment, you know, um, and here in this current job, uh, my, my job, my, my audience is the educated public, really, which, which I really enjoy because it's taking these complex topics, as you all know, and, and really educating the ASU population and the greater Phoenix population and, and the greater nation. Um, so I think really before any kind of writing, I take a step back and say, okay, who am I talking to? You know, what would resonate with them and what won't? Because then it just really gives me direction and saves a lot, a lot of time about the potential impact of the things that I'm creating. That's awesome. And that's definitely something that I try and think about all the time. I always tell people that like, I kind of feel like science communication is just translation and like learning to speak different languages, you know? So like with my job, I'm going to, I'm going to explain our research differently. If I'm talking to the Fisher's working group that we work with versus if I'm talking to one of the laboratories whose data we're using in the analysis, you know, it's like the same information, but just spoken in different languages. So that's definitely like something that's, and it's so challenging. Like it's really difficult to do because you have to like challenge yourself to say like, hey, how, how can I take this one thing? And instead of just having an elevator pitch, like how do I make five elevator pitches that I can pull out whenever I need to use them? All right, anyone else have any questions? Yes, Daisy. Yeah. So David, do you have any tricks for, I think one of the, the failures of scientists, right, is, is the science communication. I actually spent a year doing a science communication fellowship with Environmental Health News. Um, and in that, it was shocking to me. And it was the, the most horrifying part of it was that you have to, um, you have to say things like you want the headline to be something catchy enough for people to want to read it. But then the science part of you is like, but that's not actually correct. Or there's all these caveats that go along with it. So when you're working with somebody on a piece, what are, what are some of the ways that you get them around that, that the, the people that are reading this don't know all those details and they don't want to know all those details. <laughs> How do you keep people on track to things that, that really matter to, to the general public? Absolutely. You bring a great point. And I actually think it's been beneficial to me to not have a science background in the work that I do, because then I'm not afraid to ask dumb questions. You know, uh, really, I, I, I think one of the biggest takeaways of starting to work in academia specifically is to when I don't know something, 
I don't know something and I'm, why is this important? <laughs> like, why, why should I be listening? And, and really, um, it could sometimes maybe frustrating to the, the uh, professor at the other end, but it's such a necessary work. And I, I, I ask it over and over again until I am able to articulate back to them, you know, why this is important or what are the key takeaways. Um, another thing that I, I do want to note is, is the way I approach um, you know, writing a press release about research or just a general news story is thinking about storytelling. You know, you know what what is compelling about this? You know, is this 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 brand new research that for for that can you know that gives us new information about how to um, track invasive species along the Salt River? You know, like who are the characters in the story? You know, what is this professor's background? You know, I, I, I'm always looking through the lens of, of the storytelling. For example, I recently wrote a, a profile on a new professor um, who is a, a geographer, but also a statistician. Um, and I could have written a, a cut dry uh, story on um, Professor Pete Rogerson joins ASU's school, blah, 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 blah. Um, but one of the first questions uh, to him was, is, so why are you doing this and not working in a bank? You know, like, why is this interesting to you? Um, and he, out of it came this beautiful narrative where he told me, he said, as a kid, he's just fascinated with patterns. You know, at age 12, he memorized uh, pi to the hundredth digit. You know, uh, he told me an anecdote of when he was a kid, his younger sister lost the dollar bill at the neighbor's house um, and he memorized the serial number. So they got it back. You know, those those are the stories. I mean, you know, like I said, you know, all of you are engaged in your research for a reason, you know, um, and those are important reasons, you know, and I, I think humanizing research is something that I really enjoy and I think resonates well with especially the general audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's so cool. And also like one of I always try to remember, you know, stories are not only more compelling and more interesting, but you will literally remember better things that you learn through stories versus things that you just like read in a textbook. That's just how humans are like hardwired to remember and communicate and like pass information on like across disciplines and also like generationally like through stories that's how we that's how we communicate and so like tapping into that for science communication is just like that's the way you gotta go mariana yeah um kind of tagging along on this um storytelling um i guess my biggest question would be how to create a unique voice in a world of branded and kind of copy paste you know, professionalism and trying to maintain that um, the reputation of science and professional, but also making it palpable for the general public to take in and also fun and interesting. What, how do you develop a voice that's unique that doesn't just sound like, you know, copy paste every week, that kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. And I, I sometimes still struggle with that too. Um, and honestly, I mean, the best advice I could give um, is that, I mean, we're all unique. I mean, we all have our own voice, you know, and if we try to imitate anyone else, it's just going to come out and feel very imitated. So um, I often, you know, um, I, I, I like to read and I'm sure many of you guys like to read. Um, and the best advice that I have given at a very early age was um, you get better at writing by reading good writing, you know, um, and and just through that repetition, it, you, you, fear, you, you find things that you like and you don't like, you know, and then you're able to incorporate that into your writing. You know, oftentimes I'll read something. I love reading the science section of the New York Times. And I'm like, what? Like the sea dragon story was from the New York Times. I was like, wow, this is so good. Why is it so good? And then going back and taking the time to really dissect that article. I was like, oh, this is great because they opened up this intro bringing me into the lab or they, they, they like, had these little anecdotes to put the person, um, right, to, to put more emotion into the person giving the, doing the research. You know, like find, reading the things that you like and then incorporating just the very best of the best into your own writing makes your own voice. Um, and then that, I mean, I, I like to say that, you know, when you try to force things, they sound forced, you know, but, you know, when it just, when you just 
right like you talk i mean and you you speak your mind and it, it flows it, it you can you can feel someone feel and read someone's emotion um when when they have it thank you that honestly sounds like a fun activity that maybe we should do one month is um because we've done activities before where we've like found different articles and brought them in and then tried to communicate the articles but that sounds really fun if we if we did that one one month and each just like found a piece of science writing that we really liked and then dissected like why we thought it was written so well okay i'm gonna i'm gonna put that on the docket for a for a meeting all right we've got about 10 minutes left does anyone have any other questions I have a question, but I'm not sure if we can answer it here because I'm not sure, but it's more of like, have you guys heard how uh, that the ocean communication uh, science community isn't doing as well as the space community? And I didn't know if we could explore how do we improve and beat space because we need our ocean to be just as cool, if not cooler. So was, was there some kind of a, an article that you read that was talking about mm -hmm. that? I there mean, is. I'll make sure to send it to you. I'll, yeah, I'll please do. Could you actually yeah. just um like I'm gonna send out a follow up email to this with the recording? Could you reply to that with the article? I, I, will. I will. I I have an interesting anecdote if I can add to that. You know, so um, as I mentioned, I, I cover you know, the environmental sciences here at ASU, and my colleague cover covers space. Um, last month, my colleague was on vacation, so I was tapped in to write my first space story. Um, and in my own opinion, I think is um, space is just sexy. I mean, honestly, I mean, like, how can, I mean, just the idea of this infinite world of exploration, okay. you know? Uh, Be so, I mean, <laughs> can we just talk about how great that place is? <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I think, I think both Boats? oceans <laughs> and space are very sexy for sure um but I, I i you know in my in my work in working on i wrote a story about um the moon and there's these two domes there that um uh that are similar to earth there's there's two domes on the moon um that are similar in in um uh what do you call it in in, in the way they're made up on earth but the way they're made up on Earth requires a lot of water and tectonic plates, and the moon doesn't have that. So ASU researchers are going out there. They're setting this um, gamma ray spectrometer um, to go out there on the moon and sample, you know, how are these domes created, you know? Um, and for, you know, media, it's, it's a lot easier to imagine, you know, like, like this, this dare into the unknown and like, what is the, what is, why is this created and why, why we know so little about it? You know, and uh, I think just that range of curiosity, you know, this because we don't know so much about it potentially could be a reason why people are so attracted to space, not on top of all the the Star Treks of the world, you know, um, movies and media. I think really, if we just got Neil deGrasse Tyson to um, say something about oceans, that would be the fix right there. <laughs> Okay, I have a bone to pick with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Though. I think that he's so he he just always makes everything like and science is the truth and you have to believe it. I'm like that's going to alienate a lot of people. But he does explain things very well. Um okay, we've got just let's do like 2 minutes for a few more questions and then 5 minutes to kind of wrap up and chat about chat about next time. So if anyone has anything else, speak now or forever hold your peace. I don't know if we should be allowed to do repeat animals, just there's too many sea creature animals. Oh, there's you were reading my chats from earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, there's too many fun things. <laughs> my other alternative was the Greenland shark because they can live for like hundreds of years. You just want to stick around forever. But they're lonely. So that's why I picked the orca. No. You want to see the rise and fall of civilizations. Yeah. <laughs> The, the ocean can be so much cooler than the space. I think we need our own Neil deGrasse Tyson. There you okay, go. Anybody from this group? We we just, I know. We just got to make our own. <laughs> um, 
All right, well, let's just go ahead and, and wrap up with a few pointers for next time. So for those of you who are new to this group, we also have a document that I made um, for the group that I share with everyone um, that I call our science communication toolbox or toolkit. And so I keep summarized notes in there. I always take, take notes during all the meetings. Um, and I summarize notes with like some of the takeaways that we learned. Um, and then also any articles, so like the one that, that Mariana posted. Um, Ariadne, is that the one that you were talking about or is that different? Yes, yes it is. It's the one I'm talking about. Awesome. Okay. okay. I'll just go ahead and put that in the toolkit then. Um, and toolkit toolbox, I don't remember which one I called it, tool something. Um, but I'll go ahead and put that in there. And then it's an open document that's um, available for anyone to edit who is on the document. So feel free to add any of your own notes or takeaways from today. Um, and we'll use that as just kind of a catch all place to um, keep track of everything that we're learning because, you know, this interest group is like um, part of it is just for discussion and connection, but it's also like I've learned so much throughout all of the um, discussions and interactions that we've had with our various guest speakers and then our discussions and activities that we've had amongst ourselves as well. So um, I like keeping that all in one place and, you know, um, barring the fact that like a lot of us don't have time to go travel to California and get a science communication certificate. I feel like this is the next best thing because we get to have a um, monthly meeting where we just learn a little bit more each time about how to be the most effective communicator so that um, we can overtake space in terms of how cool our communication is. Um, so anyways, all of that, if anyone has any last minute thoughts, um, Mariana, do you have anything to add for the science communication group or if you wanna, um, any announcements from the smaller group? I can't think, Stacey, do you have anything? No, Allie, can you let me share my screen or I guess David, you're the, yeah, David, you're the host. You're the host. <laughs> okay. I, wanted, I wanted to show you, so I've, I've been working with one of the OSU um, infographics guys and he came up with, Jared started me off on this, um, put together kind of an overview of our lab. Um, oh. oh, sweet. Here, I think I got made the host again. So Stacy, I'm making you the host. We're just okay. gonna pass it around like a hot potato. Okay, all right. <laughs> I am now the host. I have power. Okay, so this one was for the nanoplastics um, research that we do in our lab. So you have the, the plastics weight, fate and transport, Ooh, nice. you have the micro and nano, and then our different toxicity, which feeds into risk analysis, and then our science education part. Um, but my lab doesn't just do plastics. So I came back to him and said, we do nanomaterials too. So let me show you what he did. Um, so he added some of these engineered nanomaterials up here. Um, and then we still have the plastics and they flow in, but now we have it the nano fraction, we have some of the engineered materials in there. Same setup. Pretty cool though. Um, you know, as far as it telling the story of my lab, um, it pretty much does, other than we don't have the microcosms in there, but that's just a different assay. So I thought that was fun. Um, I really and, like that. That's well yeah. done. Good job. Yeah. So Suzanne, if you want him to adapt that for your um, mycids and silver slides, let me know. I'll put you in touch with him. Yeah, because it would just yeah. be an easy, an easy switch, right? For you. That's so. really impressive. Who's yeah. the artist that you worked with for that? Sean Carver. He's been working with Kim Anderson um, in toxicology, um, doing the kind of the translation um, pieces for about a decade. So cool. he's pretty well versed in like the sciencey part of it. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I thought it was cool. But Jared gave us the original layout. He did a put a put together one for a an nice. overview. Congrats, Jared. Yeah. It looks like sticks compared to that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, sketches always look like sticks at the start. Just bio render for it, but <laughs> but yours was free. Yeah, it was free. <laughs> You what you paid for, right? There's something to be said for that. <laughs> Thank you so much, David and, and Ellie. This was really awesome. Yeah, nice of course. To kick start and back up. Um, Mariana, do you want to show um, some stickers real quick? Suzanne mentioned it in the chat. Yeah, I have. Oh, if you could allow me to screen share. Stacy, will you take um, 
pass the hot potato <laughs> host over to Mariana. <laughs> yep. I love it. Two years in and we just do the Zoom, you know? <laughs> I don't know why it didn't have the button for making someone a co-host, but okay. this is more fun anyway. I am the host now. Okay, so here are our wooden stickers. Um, they the look so much better with the dark background. I like they do. They're Ooh, pretty cool. I love a they're wood, so they're no plastic, and they're a good size. Um, this is one that I have on my water bottle right now, 32 ounce hydro. So this is the old one that we did. You can see it a little bit better on the new one. Oh, yep, um, definitely. So yeah, they're awesome. And they get them to us within just a couple of days, and they're super, super easy, easy to work with. Um, it's called the wooden pen. Um, but yeah, so these are our new wooden sticks that we've got. So those are pretty fun. Yeah, how do we do? I, I agree with I'm that. getting a dozen for our lab, Jared. Oh, are they resilient? Okay. Like, can you wash these things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mine's gone through the dishwasher twice and it still looks fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. That's yeah. a test for sure. <laughs> There's the website and they make um, pins too. That was like the wooden pin. They initially started with pins and now they make stickers too. Um, but they're, they're pretty cool. They do, um, they work with the 1% for the planet, one tree planted. Nice. They do a bunch of stuff and really focus on the eco-friendly side of things too. So, um, we like to see that. So, awesome. Yeah, that's a little update from that. Good job. Well, yeah, we just, we just hit 10 AM. So if anyone has to hop off, feel free. Um, thank you, David, so much for coming and chatting with us. And it's good to see you again. Um, I'll, I don't know the next time that I'll, that I'll be in Arizona. Mary, my boss tends to hop over here to Hawaii instead of having me. Bye Ezra. Good to see you. Um, instead of having me hop over to Arizona, but I'll let you know if I'm there and we can go, we can go climbing again. So, um, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you for a fantastic discussion and I will follow up with an email and see you in August. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Do you need host responsibilities back for any reason? <laughs> um, I, think I guess that, when I leave. Yeah, I think we're good at this dog. point. Do you have like two minutes, um, Mariana, yeah, to stay on? Okay, awesome. Uh, yay. Thank you so much. I'm glad that that worked out. Do you, um, it, from your perspective, just since you've been leading the smaller group, was there anything else that you like needed to talk about this time or like, because I've totally am fine with, um, giving you like five, 10 minutes at the start of each meeting. If you need to like circle around, or if you like want to share, like, Hey, we've been working on this infographic, we've been working on this. What are what's feedback? So like, is there anything that you might need from the next meeting? Um, well, right now, um, our biggest focus is kind of getting prepared for the, um, we don't really even have a name for it officially, but the earth friendly certification program that we're trying to work on oh, in Corvallis, cool. OSU Corvallis. I think we're trying to adopt like the five star certification that Bonnie had previously done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so taking that and adopting it and making it work for OSU and the Corvallis community. Um, so we're looking for people that I think Lily is going to kind of um, head start the student involvement with that. Um, so we're always open to ideas, thoughts, best of practices for that. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that process, like what goes into it and what what do you need to get that put through? We're kind of starting from scratch. They had previously done um, the ocean friendly certification and basically the, the businesses had to meet a certain amount of checkpoints or um, do- Oh, so kind of like the ocean friendly establishments? Yes, that. Cool, okay. That, but revamping it to make it new and sexy. <laughs> okay so correct me if I'm wrong but the last time I was in Corvallis which was literally 2019 2018 or 2019 I remember going to a couple restaurants like down by the river and seeing mm -hmm. that they had some kind of a certification so are are you like is it the same program but revamped or is it like a different it's going to be along the same lines it's it's old um, and it hasn't been followed up with, but that was the initial thing. And that was with the 500 women scientists. There's some other group um, that Suzanne was working with to get that going. Cause yeah, Java stops here on campus has that. And I think McMinimins yeah. has it. Like there's a few that do. Yep. I think it was um, the McMinimins that I, that I went to. 
Yeah. God, I yeah. So we're wanting, not so we're, much. we're wanting to do that, but make it a little bit more rather than ocean friendly, make it eco earth friendly and um, see how we can make it more sustainable to um, maintain as, um, as the certifiers and see how we can maybe get like a um, business portion of our website where they can be, you know, represented on the website as, you know, certified, you know, that kind of thing. So it's cool. very much ground up, like we're in the development process of it. So that would be good to get ideas and or people that want to be involved with helping with that um, process. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I think that's on, our biggest on the docket for next, for next meeting then to get, um, uh, get feedback on that. Perfect. And then at our next small meeting, um, I will mention that we'll have a couple of minutes to, to put out asks and or feedback. So um, I will make sure to incorporate that in each of our meetings to Beautiful. have something to bring. So I'll plan Awesome. That. Love it. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, of that. course. And as I, I, I was jotting down some notes about the future meetings, so I'll just email you with all of the ideas and then we can decide which one we want to do next and, and okay. all that jazz. Cool. Sounds good. And I, ugh, I'm really bad. It's best if you email me at my email rather than the um, consortium email. Oh, perfect. Um, um, let me go ahead and also put your full email on our list because I don't think I have it on there yet. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that's my school email. That's the one I've got connected to everything. The consortium one, I just check when I'm working. Okay. Um, so I will be much more responsive to that email than the consortium email. Dude, I'm the same way with my personal email versus my Everblue email because I'll check my Everblue email like a couple of times a week. But mm -hmm. right now I've got my I've got my full time job like Monday through Friday. And so I'm on that email constantly. And then mm -hmm. my personal email, I'm also using for a contract position that I'm doing right mm -hmm. now. Like a, it's just like summer field work. Mm -hmm. Um and so Everblue, I really only get to the email like twice a week. And so mm -hmm. sometimes I miss things. That it's like, I'm sorry, I don't have time to check this when I'm yeah. not specifically working on it. So yeah, if I'm, well, and if it's I'm, just not that busy either. So exactly. you know, when it pops up and it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, ah, yes, there it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Exactly. I will, I will email you as, um, for all of that then at Oregon State. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And Hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Have a good one. <laughs> Talk soon. See ya.